Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you uh, this afternoon, and we hope that you're ready for the study from God's Word. We're going to be talking about uh, following the crowds and uh, how how it is that this idea of uh, social pressure can actually make you lose your soul. Uh, the idea that your uh, your peers can influence you to uh, really wind up a place that no one really wants to go, but it's all because of peer pressure and the, uh, uh, the, the our built-in desire really to want to conform to what everybody else is doing. And so uh, I hope that you will stay with us uh, this afternoon and let us study uh, from God's Word to find out really how we are, what, how we're made up, and what it is that uh, we can do to recognize the things that are that are leading us down a road to uh, to destruction, I mean Jesus said uh, brought us the way and uh, why does the gate lead unto destruction and many there be which go in there at and so majority of people are going down this road. We're we're trying to find out how to get off this road and how to how to get on the straight and narrow, if you will, and why is it that people have a hard time getting off that uh, off that straight and narrow? That's really what we're wanting to look at. And so uh, I hope that you're ready for a, a study. I hope you have your pens and paper and your Bible in hand and so that we can study God's Word together. I want you to uh, uh, examine what we're saying. I don't want you to take what I'm saying as at face value and and uh, not uh, examine it or scrutinize it because we certainly want you to uh, look into what we're saying and, and examine to see if what we're saying is true. But we want you to uh, be open-minded and, and consider that uh, maybe what you've been taught may not be exactly right. It may not be uh, the truth uh, or it may not be the whole truth. And so maybe you, you need to uh, consider if you're being influenced to uh, do some things or go in a certain direction that you, that you shouldn't be, all right? So anyway, we hope that you will stay with us this, uh, uh, this evening, this afternoon as we study from God's Word together here on the Word from the Lord. Friends, the Word from the Lord brought to you by the Church of Christ and uh, we're meeting at 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. You can reach me at uh, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's phone number 276-340-2653. That's 276-340-2653. If you want to be a part of this program, uh, it's a live calling program. You can reach me at area code 336 uh, that's area code 336, and the phone number is 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-WLOE. Uh, and uh, that's how you can be a part of the program uh, this this evening. And I hope that you will uh, certainly uh, feel free to call in and, and engage in some dialogue. We have phone calls from time to time, and... Uh, it's always good if we can have some back and forth and uh, uh, you know get to get to know what what people are thinking and so if you are want to be part of the program uh, we encourage you to call and be and be part of that okay so let's get back to following following the crowd you know let's start off with when we're when we're young you know uh, folks we have a have a built-in desire uh, to fit in with with people that are around us, even though it may be a small group, uh, we're, we're we're kind of born with social interactions, the wanting to be with individuals. I mean, just think about it: a baby is crying, and uh, you know, reaching up, arms up, reach. Why? Because they want to fit in. They want to be held. They want to be uh, 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 coddled. They want to be uh, you know, comforted and eased and things like that. And so that that. Uh, that desire to be wanted is what really is is causing individuals to conform to peer pressure or social pressure, as often as time uh, is, is is called. Now, you know the pressure from the group to conform is not always a bad thing. It's, it's not always a bad thing. I mean, if you um, just think about it, I mean, social pressure can cause individuals. We, you, we normally think about peer pressure as being bad. Right, uh, the idea of uh, individuals being pressured to do think something that they shouldn't, or wanting to fit in so bad that they'll do things that maybe they normally wouldn't do. 
uh, example, it's, it's sort of like if someone says, well, uh, uh, maybe you like a movie, maybe one of your, your favorite movie or favorite TV show or video game or something, and and you're with a group of your friends and somebody starts bringing up this video game or this TV program or whatever it may be, and a lot of people start downing it, you know, oh, I hate that, I don't like that, that's a stupid show, that's a stupid game, whatever, and and so that social conformity is what causes you not to say anything. Even though that's your favorite television show or movie or, or video game, social uh, pressure causes you not to say anything because you want to fit in. You want to be the, the odd one out. You want to be accepted. And so uh, that, that's just a small example of it. But as, as, you, as you go on, as you get older, there's other peer pressures, other social pressures that maybe will, you know, can influence you for good. Um, you know, oftentimes I think when you're in a, with a group of, uh, of people, if they're doing well, they're doing something uh, that improves them or challenges them, oftentimes that can challenge other people to do well too. Uh, maybe friends can encourage friends to uh, uh, participate in an activity that is good, that's wholesome, and they do so because their friends are doing it. You know, maybe they're going out and and um, picking up trash on the road. You know, I mean, when I was in uh, 4-H, that's what we did. We had a you know one of these uh, adopt a highway programs, and we kept a stretch of a road uh, cleaned up. And so the idea that if if one of your friends is doing something, then you want to participate in that. So you wind up doing something good and and wholesome as well. And of course, normally we think about the the adverse effects, where people will uh, do things that they know are wrong, even to the point of uh, uh, or do things that are, are wrong just because they're following the crowd. Now, uh, for example, social pressure uh, it may be good or it may be bad depending on the the extent of it. Now think about it this way: if you're in a room where there's a fire. All right. Social pressure is kicks in that, that hurting behavior kicks in, and everybody's running for the door. And so you you get into the the herd. You get into the the group of people that are running for the door. Well, that's good. That's smart because you know the room's on fire. And so if you're if that social pressure to be with the crowd didn't kick in, then you might be in the room that's that's on fire. But at the same time, that hurting pressure can cause you to miss something that's very important. Because it may be that there's two exits in the room where the fire is, and everybody's trying to get out one, and only a few people are getting out the, the other exit because they know where it is. And so because everybody's following the crowd, they're all trying to cram out one door. Let's say you've got 50 people that are trying to get out one door, and there's five people that actually make it out of the second door. Whereas if everybody was um, not so inclined to follow the crowd, you know, half the people could get, they could get out twice as fast because uh, half the people could go out one door and half the people could go out the other door. And so that, that idea of social pressure, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. I, uh, uh, I was watching a, uh, uh, program I heard uh, I'd, I'd actually seen it and I heard uh, uh, Glenn Beck on the radio be talking about talking about it and he said he would be talking about it the next day but I'd already seen it it's called the push and uh, it's very interesting uh, I guess it was a reality show uh, I will say that it had some language in it I wasn't expecting and so it needs it needs a, a filter on it but uh, this this program, this show called The Push, uh, demonstrated how in just over an hour, social pressure was placed on a man to the point that he had to decide whether or not he was going to kill someone. And you might say, well, that would be an easy call. You know, I would say, no, I'm not going to kill this person. But when you see it play out, it was a struggle... It was a struggle uh, when he was making this decision. <laughs> do I actually kill this person, push him off the building, or, or do I not? And uh, I just I was just amazed at the 
at the obvious pressure that this man was feeling just based upon the group that was that was uh, pressuring him that was telling him this is the only way out this is the only way that you can escape this you got yourself in a in such an ordeal that the only way out is to to kill this person and it was just amazing and then to show how they selected the person for the for the show was even more mind blowing i mean it was it was pretty uh, amazing as well but you know, friends, the Bible talks about following the crowd and not following the crowd. In, in, the, in the, uh, Exodus 23, Exodus 23 and verse 2, the Bible says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Now, you know, that sounds pretty easy. Uh, don't, follow, don't follow a crowd to do evil. But you have to realize, friends, that there's a reason why God is saying this because God knows how we're made up. God knows our our mindset, he knows how we're, we're designed, and he knows how strong the pressure of the group really is on, on individuals uh, to conform and how you can be carried away into doing evil. Uh, let me give you another verse. In Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, uh, verse 1, Proverbs, I'm assuming chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, Solomon is giving... Uh, some wisdom to his son. He says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Uh, in verse 10, he says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down to the pit, we shall all we shall find all precious substance we shall fill our houses with spoil cast in thy lot among us let us all have one purse my son walk not thou in the way with them refrain thy foot from their path for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of the bird and they lay wait for their own blood they look privily for their own lives so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Now, if that's not a picture of modern-day gangs, I don't really know what, what it is. But here Solomon's wisdom is, don't follow the crowd. Refrain. And, friends, like I said, it's easier said than done when you think about the peer pressure that people have. Now, don't follow a multitude to do evil. Let's start with that for a moment. Let's just start with the idea of what is evil. I mean, you think about it. Don't follow the multitude to do evil. Okay, well, who gets to decide what, what, what's evil? I mean, does the crowd get to decide? I mean, are we just all going to take a vote on what's evil and what's good? Or are we going to have a, another standard? I mean, listen to this. In Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, and uh, we're, going to look, we're going to start reading in verse, uh, verse 12. Now, this is Pilate, and he is... He's got Jesus before him, and uh, Jesus is on trial. And he says, Pilate answered and said again unto them, unto the Jews, what will, what will ye then that I shall do unto him who is called king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. So Pilate said unto them, Why? Uh, so, me, so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Now, you listen to the pressure here. Of course, they're saying, telling Pilate, you know, if you don't do this, you're not a friend of the of the king, and so you're, you know, you're going to be removed. He realized all the social pressure that's on him to actually condemn Christ. Now, we see that, and we read that in the Bible, we go, yeah, Pilate, he was just, you know, he, he was sorry, no good dog. Well, I, I agree with that. But I'm saying, too, when you realize the pressure to conform to the crowd, it is extremely hard. It's, it's a hard thing to overcome. I'm not excusing him. I'm just trying to, I'm understanding that the pressure that comes from the crowd is 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 very great and that's why you know Pilate did what he did now uh look at luke 23 let's look at luke 23 and verse and verse 3 
Luke 23, Luke 23, and we're going to start in verse 23. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified, and the voices of them and of the chief priest prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. So the, the voices of this, of this crowd prevailed. Now, friends, if you pay attention to the news, you see a lot of people that are, you know, they're shouting, they want to get their way, and, man, they, they prevail. They, they prevail. They get their way. Even the minority, the small minority prevails because they get their way. And so it gets the crowd going. You think about these uh, uh, riots you see on TV. I mean, who starts it? I mean, who starts these riots on TV? It starts somewhere. Somebody started it, and the whole city, I mean, the whole multitude, the mass, all, you know, got caught up in it. And so who decides what's right and wrong here? Who decides uh, what is evil or not? I mean, God says, follow not... Uh, don't follow the multitude do evil. So who gets to determine what is, what is evil and, and what is not evil? Now, Luke 23 and verse 50, I want you to read about a man. Luke 23 and verse 50, come on down. Now, Jesus has been uh, crucified. And the Bible says in verse 50, And behold, there was a, a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man, good man and a just the same had not consented to the to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, uh, wherein never man was laid. So here is here is Joseph of Arimathea. He didn't consent. See, he didn't follow the crowd, but. You realize this was, you know, it took a strong man not to follow the crowd. So who determines what's right and what's wrong? You cannot listen to the majority and say, well, the majority thinks it's right, therefore it's right. Friends, the majority, uh, you know, may think abortion's right. That doesn't make it right. The majority may think homosexuality is right. That doesn't make it right. The majority of people, listen, the majority of people, the reason why, Cities and towns and counties are, are, are wet. That is, that's why they sell alcohol is because the majority of people say we want it. That doesn't make it right. See, the majority is not what determines what's right and wrong. And so we have to realize there must be another standard. There has to be a, a standard, and that's the Bible. That's what we're saying. Let's, let's get back to the Bible. Let's don't follow a multitude to do evil. Let's follow the Bible and... You know, don't be a part of that of that great crowd. Now, listen, the crowd will blindly follow a blind leader. Let me say it again. The crowd will blindly follow a blind leader. In Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13, listen to what what Jesus says. Now, he's already told the uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and and uh, those folks that their doctrines, that the, their tradition that they followed were, were violating God's commands. And his disciples said, you know, that they were offended when they heard this. And he answered and said unto them, this is Matthew 15, 13, if you're writing it down, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. Now, Here's, my, here's the point that I want you to, to, to consider. You know, we're talking about those riots. The reason why they get so out of hand is because people follow the crowd. They get caught up in the hype. They get caught up in the, in the emotion, in the energy. And, you know, who started it? I mean, you watch a ball game. Uh, let's say a, uh, a championship game or whatever. Everybody in the stands winds out on the winds up out on the field or on the on the court. Who starts that? Somebody jumped up out of their seat. You see, and the next thing you know, everybody, man, we, we just got to be part of the crowd. We're running down there, and people are getting hurt and stomped and maimed and injured and even killed because somebody started it. Somebody started the mob, 
and the mob mindset sets in and everybody follows. Well, God says, look, what you need to do is you need to stop being part of the crowd and ask why. Why are we doing this? Why are we all running out like crazy people and, you know, tearing down the goalpost? Or why are we running like crazy people and, you know, throwing uh, bombs and rocks and breaking windows and looting? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we turning over cars and burning them? See, if, but the, the thing is, if you're not part of the crowd to start with, then it's easier to say, I'm not going to be part of that. But if you're in part of the crowd, then you know, more than likely you're going to just follow it. You're, you're going to follow into that, in that mindset because it's already started. And here's why. It's because the crowd, the crowd influences people. The crowd influences people. Uh, I want you to consider uh, this. This is an article that talks about the influence that people can have on other people even when people know that something is wrong. This, this article talks about a, a famous uh, psychologist named Solomon Ash. Uh, he conducted this study and what he did he showed subjects he showed he showed people two cards on the first card was just a line just a line on the second card there were three lines and one of them the same length as the line on the first card so one card has just one line the second card has three lines and one of those lines is identical to the one on the first card. And then he showed it to, he was going to show these two cards and he was going to see if people could pick which two lines were the same. But what he did was, before the experiment started, he arranged for seven people to give the wrong answer on purpose. To purposely give the wrong answers uh, before the rest of the people did. All right? So he instructed sometimes you give wrong answers, sometimes you don't. But uh, we're going to see, you know, who will follow the lead of giving the wrong answers. And so uh, despite the, you know, the simple simplicity of the task, I mean, look at two lines. Which two lines are the same? Uh, three out of four subjects that 75% of the people agreed with an incorrect answer that was given by one of their peers at least once. And one in four subjects, that's 25% of the time, 25% uh, of the people agreed with the wrong answer 50% of the time. So at least half the time, one out of those four people are going to give the wrong answer just because Somebody else gave the wrong answer. Now, this uh, uh, this study was done again <clears throat> by a man named Gregory Burns, and he found almost identical results. Uh, what he did was he took two groups of subjects uh, and asked them to look at objects and decide whether they were the same or different. And uh, what he did was he put them all, before the, the test, he put them all in a room and all the subjects and all the people that were in on the, you know, we're going to give wrong answers. He put them all in the room, let them all chat, you know, get to know each other, play some games, uh, take pictures with one another and so forth. Bonding, you know, they're going to be part of the group. Let's all fit in. And then uh, he took them in to do this, to do this test. And one by one, uh, as the participants were, came in to do the study, they were hooked up to a brain scanner that allowed the researchers to see what part of the brain responded to the task. And <clears throat> out of the 32 volunteers, uh, there were only four people that, that were going to give the wrong answers. Now, uh, here's the results. The, the people were told, first, the others would discuss their observations as a group. 
then decide if the objects were the same or different. The person was shown the group's answer and then the object. In other words, so as they did this study, each person came in and they were told, all right, now the group all said this one was right. And sometimes the group all totally unanimously agreed on an incorrect response. And other times it was unanimous on the correct one. There were very few mixed mixed answers. And so the, the point is, on average, people went along with an answer because the majority of the people had given it. Now, friends, that to me, that is very, very telling because even though even though they may be able to see the right and wrong, when they're told the majority of people gave this answer, they're still going along with it. They're still going along with it. And so that's the power that, the, that a group can have on a larger group. Now, has that ever happened before? Well, let's look. Let's go back to, to the Bible. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 38. Exodus 12 and verse 38. <clears throat> now, these are the, the children of Israel coming out of, out of Egypt. And the Bible says, The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds and even very much cattle. All right, so this mixed multitude left Egypt with the, children of Egypt, with the children of Israel. Now, in Numbers 11, Numbers 11, guess what happens? It came to pass when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord had burnt among them. Now, that that um, should make you think, you know what? Uh, we're not going to murmur and complain anymore. I mean, God ca God called the fire to consume some of these individuals who were who were complaining. But look at the next verse in Numbers eleven verse four. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So even when they complained, and even though they experienced the, the, the punishment, or they saw the punishment that God brought on the people, this mixed multitude actually influences them to complain again. Now you see the power of that? Can you can you realize? Do you realize that even though you can see, all right, this, here's some consequences. If we start complaining, I mean, the Lord has already consumed some of our our brethren over here. Uh, we need, need to be happy that that God has um, provided us with this uh, manna, and not worry about what we used to have in Egypt when we were in bondage. But see, they forgot about all that because of the multitude, the mixed multitude, the the crowd. They were following a crowd, a mixed multitude, to murmur and complain against God, even when they had just seen God's punishment upon others who complained. And so uh, th that is a, a powerful statement or shows you that, uh, man, the crowd can get you in trouble. And the idea that, you know, I have to break away from that crowd. I need to, I, I need to stop following what everybody else is doing <clears throat> if I want to be saved, I can't follow, be following this crowd now. So, so how do you solve the problem? How do you then not fall in line with the multitude? How do you not uh, get caught up in the, the mob mentality or, or the, the, the carrying away? Well, you need to separate from the crowd. Separate from the crowd. In Numbers 13, I'm sorry, Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 13, I want you to consider this. <clears throat> On that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and there was found written that the Ammonite 
and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them, howbeit God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they heard the law, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Elisha the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied unto Tobiah. So, uh, <clears throat> so here they are. They're, they're caught up in these with marrying amongst these other nations that God has said now, you know, the Moabite and the Ammonite shouldn't come to the congregation of the house of God forever. You know, there are certain nations that you, that you just couldn't marry. But here they were. Here they were. And so what did they do? They separated from them. They, they separated. When they heard this, they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. If you're a Moabite or an Ammonite, no. You, you don't get to be a part of this. Now, friends, you might say, well, James, that's easier said than done. Well, it may be. It may be easier said than done, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And so what I'm trying to get you to see, friends, is that you may be following the crowd. You may be following the crowd to, to do evil. You may be following the crowd and, and saying, well, we're all going down this one road and, and that's all fine and well and good. But it may be you need to stop and say, you know what, I've, I've got to check and see where I'm going. Are we going in the right direction? Are we just, are we just following the crowd, following the herd? <clears throat> you know, I've been, in, I've been in places before where you're just, I mean, you're shoulder to shoulder with the crowd and you're trying to get in or out of some place. And it's a... Uh, you know, it, it, to me, it wasn't a very comfortable situation. I didn't like being in close proximity to all these people when you're just kind of, you know, stumbling through the crowd or trying to trying to get out of a door or you know through a little uh, into into a building or in, out of a building. And but you just kind of had to meander along. But uh, the thought, my thought process, and all that was, man, I got to get out of here. You know, I, I want to get out of this mess. I want to get out of this crowd. Give me a little elbow room. Well, that ought to be what you're saying when it comes to following the crowd who is not doing what God said. I gotta separate from that. I gotta separate from that. Now, here's why this is so important. <clears throat> Excuse me, friend. The crowd can keep you from Christ. Do you think about that? The crowd can keep you from obeying Christ. They can actually keep you, hinder you from Christ. Now, we're going to discuss that in a moment. I'm going to give you phone numbers in case you want to call in. Uh, 336 is the phone number. 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-WLOE. Again, that area code is 336. 627-9563 or 427-9696. Or you can call me 276-340-2653. Be glad to... Um, uh, take a call on on my phone. That's that's my own private cell phone. But you can be. I'll be glad to take your call there. So, so how can the crowd keep you from Christ? In Luke chapter nineteen, in Luke chapter nineteen, we read about Jesus coming through through Jericho. The Bible says that Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man, among, uh, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. Now Zacchaeus, and we might, you might have sung this song in Bible class. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. But the reason why he climbed up in the sycamore tree is because he could not see Jesus because the people. And it may be the people didn't like him. I mean, he was a, he was a publican. He was a tax collector. And he was rich. And he was the chief among the publicans. So not only was he a publican, not only was he rich, but he was the, the big dog, you might say. You know, he was the chief of the, among the publicans. And so... Uh, already, you know, the crowd's 
maybe hindering from seeing Jesus, but maybe if they looked around and saw who he was, and he was a little man anyway, of small stature, they might have been doubly um, intending on not letting him see Jesus. So what he did, he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree, and of course you know the story that Jesus passed by and looked up in the tree and said, come down and I'm going home with you. But that's really what we're talking about, friends. You need to realize that the crowd that you're running with and the crowd that you're that you're following, they may be keeping you from Christ, just like Zacchaeus. They may be hindering you from obeying the gospel. You say, well, James, how is that possible? Well, I want you to read, read with me two different accounts of of people and then we're going to we're going to read two of them we're going to go back and we're going to talk about them some more but the first one is in john chapter 9 john chapter 9 is a blind man that jesus has healed and he has been uh he's being questioned about about his healing john chapter 9 and we're going to start in verse about verse uh oh let's um Let's look at verse 14. John 9, we're going to start in verse 14. And it came, and it was on the Sabbath, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened the eye, opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees asked, also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees also asked him, I mean, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do much miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him, that he, he that opened thine eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. And received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. They asked him, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now, that's the blind man being questioned. And his parents are questioned. And they said, well, he's of age, ask him. Now, let's turn over to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And let's look at, let's start about verse uh, 37. John 12, verse 37. But though he had done many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, and uh, spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now, here's the question. Why would those people in John 12 not believe Jesus even though they'd seen all these miracles? And why would the blind man's parents say, yes, that's our son, Yes, he was born blind, but you need to ask him what happened. I mean, why would they say that? Why would they say that? Well, the answer lies in the following verses. In John 12, let's just stay in John 12 since we're there. John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So they weren't going to say he's a prophet. They weren't going to say he's the Messiah. They weren't going to say that he's the Christ. They were not going to say that, you know, we believe that he is uh, a man sent from God or so forth because 
they feared being put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And then if you go back to the blind man's parents, listen to what they said. They said, he's of age, let him speak for himself. Verse 22, John 9, 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he's of age, ask him. Throw him under the bus. Oh, yep, not going not gonna to answer for him. See? Now what made him say that? What made him say that? The crowd. The multitude influenced them to not confess Christ. The crowd influenced them to conform to what the majority of people were saying, lest they should be right punished, or they should be excluded, or they should be ridiculed, or whatever. They should lose some status or place, whatever. So the crowd can keep you from doing what the Lord wants you to do. And and that's that's really where you know, a lot of people, I say, in the religious world find themselves. They find themselves saying, you know what, that's that makes sense. You know, you you you, uh, you, you folks in the church of Christ, y'all saying what's right. But man, my mama, my daddy, my sister, my brother, my grandma, my, my grandpa, boy, they would, you know, they would get me. I remember a number of years ago, I had a Bible study with uh, a young man. He he was troubled. I mean, he had a lot of strikes against him. He was, uh, well, let's just leave it at that. He was he he was troubled. I mean, he he'd been in trouble, and he uh, he said he said my 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 parents uh, said I need to get back in church. So. Uh, I don't remember exactly how I got in contact with him, but we had Bible study with him and uh, uh, had a number of Bible studies with him. And I wound up baptizing him in, um, uh, let's see, there's a, there a golf course somewhere, I guess, around, uh, if I'm thinking, if I got my directions right, maybe around Monroton or somewhere like that. Uh, maybe like on 158 going out. Anyway, there's a, there's a golf course out in that area. And it was at night. And... Um, We'd been. I had me and another brother had the Bible study with him, and and uh, we baptized him uh, in uh, and I guess a water hazard out there in the, on the golf course, and uh, we baptized him. And so you know, here's this here's this young man. Uh, he realizes he needs to straighten his life out, and so he obeys the gospel. And the next thing you know, his parents. His parents, who told him he needs to get back in church, uh, now are hindering him because, well, he's with the Church of Christ. Now, friends, you see what the crowd did? The crowd can stop you from obeying what you know the Lord says you need to do. And, and that's, that's the danger. I mean that's why God says, "Don't fall the multitude to do evil." I mean you can't you can't be worried about the crowd. You can't be worried about the crowd. Now, sometimes even the good crowd can give you trouble. Now, what do you mean the good crowd? I've, I've got that in, par in you know parentheses, air quotes. You know, good crowd. Sometimes the good crowd can even mislead you. What do I mean by that? Well, look at this in Galatians chapter two. In Galatians chapter two, you have. Uh, uh, a situation where you have Peter and uh, Barnabas and some others that are with Gentiles. They're eating with Gentiles. And the Bible says when Paul came to Antioch, he said, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I, that's Paul, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. See, there were some folks from Jerusalem before they ever got there. Uh, he was eating with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So he, he feared the Jews. Uh, 
that might say something about him eating with Gentiles. Now, this is the same man that <clears throat> has already defended going to Cornelius' house and baptizing him, teaching the gospel to him in Acts chapter 10 and 11. And here he is in Galatians 2, uh, where he now he's, you know, he's separating himself because he wants to fit in with a, a certain part of the crowd, so he separates from another part of the crowd. And Paul said, this is Galatians 2.14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews. Why compel the Gentiles to live as, to live as do the Jews? He said, uh, you know, you're a Jew, and you're living like the Gentiles. So why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? I mean, if you're a Jew and you can live like the Gentiles and you can eat certain meats and whatever and not, not worry about it, now all of a sudden, why are you worried about it when, when the Jews come? Now, here's my point. Peter was an apostle. Peter was an apostle, yet he still had this desire to, well, man, I've got to, I've got to stay with the crowd. And if anybody was doing right, it was, it was Peter. But the Bible says, the Bible says, uh, even Barnabas was carried away with a dissimulation. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their hypocrisy. See, the, the, the nature or the, the desire to follow the crowd, that's, that's strong. That's a strong desire. And, you know, brother, we have... Uh, this is not just something that affects, you know, people in, in the denominational world. This following the crowd mentality, it, it affects people in the Lord's church too. There, there are some folks in the Lord's church that follow the crowd to do things they shouldn't do. For example, uh, in our brotherhood, we have <clears throat> folks that are, uh, that want to run with, uh, the big dogs, you know, the, the well-known people. And they will do whatever it takes, you know, to get on a lectureship or to, uh, to be well-known, to be liked. And so what do they do? They follow the crowd. I mean, last month, last month, uh, there, was, uh, there was a big lectureship at, uh, at Fried Hardeman University. And they had a big lectureship. And this is a... You know, I have before me here a list of all the people that were uh, on the lectureship, and some of these, uh, some of you may not know, some of you will know, recognize some of these names, but uh, there's men like, um, I see Alan Webster, and, and here is uh, Wendell Wink, uh, no, nah, uh, Dan Winkler, Dan Winkler, and uh, Jay Lockhart, and some of these guys. These folks wind up running with anybody. But no one says anything to them because if you say anything, you have to fit in. See, I think there's a lot of Peters. There's a lot of Peters on lectureships like this. And then there's one coming up uh, in the next uh, few days at Memphis, the Memphis School of Preaching. That's where I went to school. They're the same way. They're the same way. They, they want to follow the crowd. They want to fit in. They don't want to rock the boat. So what do they do? They... You know, they don't say anything. And guys like uh, Dan Winkler, Dan Winkler's going to be at Memphis. and But no one's going to say to him, Dan, why are you with all these guys? Why are you with these these people that will run with false teachers or promote false doctrine? You know, no one says anything to the, the powers that be at Memphis uh, and says, well, you know, why are you letting these guys come? And the reason why is because they don't want to rock the boat. You know, they don't want to, they want to be on the on the crowd. They want to be with the crowd. The same reason why the blind man's mother says, ask him. Same reason why the chief priest wouldn't confess Christ. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. See, the same, it's the same reason why Peter separated himself from the Gentiles when another group came in. Because he would rather, he, he desired to have their favor rather than the Gentiles' favor. And Paul said, you're, walk, you're not walking uprightly. 
you're not walking according to the power of the gospel concerning the truth. And so he had to rebuke him. Why? Well, it's that same mentality. That's what I'm saying. So when when you say, well, you know, James, that's easier said and done, don't, don't think that even once you obey the gospel, that that desire to follow the crowd is just going to be gone. No, there, there's desire to fit in, and that's why people do what they do. That's why they compromise and, on things like this. And so, uh, you know, even, even people that you would hope would be an example. They'll lead you astray, and that's why. I, that's why when you see people, I think these guys that we just talked about, like Jay Lockhart and Dan Winkler, and some of these other guys, that's why they get to go all these places. It's because no one says anything, and then people look at it and they say, "Well, he's in the crowd. He's in the crowd, and he's doing things." So the uh, you know the Barnabases they follow along too, and they get caught up in it because they like to. You know, hey, I'm on this big lectureship now. I'm on this, uh, I'm, I've got this big platform where I get to speak and everybody is going to know who I am. Well, Luke, well whoop de do, you know, if the crowd knows you. whoop de do if the crowd knows you. If they're all going in the wrong direction, you know, you'll just know everybody, you'll just know everybody in hell. I mean, that's all that, that's, that's uh, going for and so, friends, what I'm, I'm trying to say you've got to fight this urge to be part of the crowd. Now, listen, the crowd will be lost. The multitude will be lost. I mean, the crowd says, look, the, the crowd says just believe. The majority of people in, in, the, in the religious world, they say just believe. Don't they? Oh, yeah, if you just believe, if you believe in Christ, we're all good. No, friends, the crowd doesn't get to make the rules. Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 7, in Matthew 7 and verse uh, uh, 13, he said, Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now, friends, I want to show you just how powerful, I'm going to play you a, a call, uh, just how powerful the mentality, the mindset of following the crowd really is. Now, this is a gentleman that calls in, and he's going to make a comment about uh, the majority, and see if you agree with him. And if you agree with him, then I'm going to say, you know, we, we need to talk some more. But listen to what he has to say, and I hope that I can I can get the volume on this uh, well enough for you to hear it. So, uh, uh, but this is what he this is what he says. We're talking about the majority. Talking about the majority. You're on the working Lord. Jesus said there's more people going to be in hell. Does that mean the devil wins? Well, that's what I would say, wouldn't you? No. <clears throat> I'd say this. Matthew 7, and verse 13. Jesus says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. So Jesus said there's only going to be a few that's going to get to, that's going to, get to eternal life. So does that mean the devil wins? I say it just means Boy. we have to look more earnestly to try to find the truth. Well, the more and more I watch y'all's program, the more I see that y'all say y'all have just a few people here in the surrounding counties, and y'all have some in Texas, some of Noah. So basically, y'all got a roll book of how many is going to heaven, right? No, no. I don't know how many is going to heaven. And well, first one, and, and number one, number two, you know. We don't have them. They're the Lord's people. They belong to the Lord. But again, if the majority, Jesus says the majority are going to go to hell. So why then would I want to be a part of the majority? So the way I take it, the devil won, though. Why? Okay, well, the devil got more than Jesus got. Do you think, do you think that the devil having more people, more souls than Jesus makes him a winner? I mean, seriously, sir. What? Do you think that the devil having more souls 
on his side that Jesus makes the devil the winner? Jesus is going. Jesus already destroyed the power of the devil, death. So, right. so he's already won. I want to be on the winning side. Of course, Jesus is going to be the winner. So, why why has the devil won? Well, I just don't think that this little Church of Christ clique is the only ones going. Well, can you can you find a, can you find another one in the Bible? church, you went from talking about the church to the Holy Spirit baptism. I'm talking I, about the being, you got to be baptized to go to heaven, to be in y'all's church. Do you ever, how many that y'all got on roll sir, we in don't have a church. in Central County, in <clears throat> Texas? We, we don't have a church, sir. And here's the point. Here's the point what I was asking you about. The church you're in, you can't find it in the Bible. If you're even in a church. What church are you in? And I can't find it in the Bible. What church are you in? God's church. And where do, where do, where do God's people meet? The church you're in. Where do they meet? They, they assemble. Where do they assemble? They assemble in church. If, if, if it's where do they like, where do they assemble? It's so many people. Where do they assemble, sir? Where do you where do you go on the first day of the week to assemble? Where do you go? I go three, four times a week. All right, where do you go when you go? I might go visit a Baptist church. I might go visit you're, the Church of God. You're a member of the Baptist church and a member of the Church of God at the same time? I didn't say member. I'm a member of God's family. Not Christ is God, so it's not about what we believe. It's about what the Bible teaches. Okay, now that's, I, that's a little bit more than I want to play, but the part I wanted you to hear was him saying that he was in the majority. You know, he wanted to be with the majority. And, friends, I wouldn't want to be in the majority. Jesus is not going to lose because more people are lost. People choose to be lost. They choose not to follow the Lord. They choose to be on the Broadway list of destruction. And so it's not about the devil winning or Christ winning. It's about individuals choosing to follow the crowd or not follow the crowd. So there's no way the majority of people are going to be saved. And that, that's why it pains me so much when you see these, uh, you know, these great big mega churches that don't teach anything, like Joel Osteen and some of these others, that are just, you know, they're just making people feel good while they're walking down this broad path of destruction. And so what I'm trying to get you to do, friends, is, is stop and... Ask yourself, you know, am I following the crowd? If you're in a church that you can't find in the Bible, friends, you're following the crowd. The crowd may not be very big. It may just be your family, maybe you, a few friends. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, you're following the crowd. You're following the crowd. And it's your desire to fit in with them that's going to cost you your soul. If you don't stop and say, you know what, I need to make sure that what I'm doing is following God's rule following what God says, that's that's where you know the, the decision is going to be made. So you can't keep following the crowd. The crowd's going to keep you from, from obeying Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus said a man's enemies will be there of his own household. So it may be that the people that are the crowd that's keeping you from obeying the Lord is really those in your own family. And if I can help you, I will do that I'll do all that I can to help you. Friends, I'm running out of time. I think I've got about thirty seconds left. So listen. You're, you're listening to a word from the Lord, and if you reach me, a word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653. So you can reach me, 276 340 2653. I'll be glad to help you. Always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. God bless and have a good night.